We have gathered here at Ryerson University in Toronto for the international hearings on the events of September 11th, 2001. Some might ask why such an assembly should be necessary here or anywhere 10 years after those events. One reason must be the consensus among historians and political scientists that 9-11 marked a turning point in the history of our time. Everything changed after 9-11. That is a cliche, and perhaps a politically motivated one. However, governmental responses to that day's events have reshaped our world in ways uh, I can only summarize here in the briefest manner. <coughs> the events of 9-11 have served as a cause or pretext for two major wars, producing incalculable suffering in Iraq and Afghanistan, and increasing instability throughout the Middle East. They have justified historic reversals of formal commitments to civil liberties, multiculturalism, and the protection of minorities among Western nations. And they have led to diversions of resources on a massive and global scale from public infrastructure of social security, education, and health to apparatuses of war making, surveillance, and security. But a redirection of resources that has been aimed supposedly at enhancing public safety has had the opposite effect. Among the many commentators one could cite, Paul Craig Roberts writes that Americans are unsafe today, quote, not because of terrorists and domestic extremists, but because they have lost their civil liberties and have no protection from unaccountable government power. How this came about should, he thinks, quote, be worthy of public debate and congressional hearings. In Canada, let us add, there are parallel grounds for public debate and formal hearings. Two dozen Canadians were among the direct victims of the 9-11 attacks. Six times that number of Canadian soldiers have died in Afghanistan in the longest running of the 9-11 wars. And the kettling and mass arrests of more than a 1,000 peaceful demonstrators at last year's G20 protests in Toronto, while the police made no attempt to interfere with the actions of a disorderly minority, was one sign of the extent to which civil liberties have declined in post-9-11 Canada. The importance of 9-11 as a historic turning point, then, is not in doubt. But much of what happened on that day, in the period leading up to it, and in its immediate aftermath, remains in doubt in terms most particularly of the agencies and causalities involved in that sequence of events. A second reason for being here then must be the extraordinary disproportion between the weighty and devastating consequences of 9-11 and the implausibility of the official story of 9-11. There have been determined attempts to suppress public skepticism about that official account. Ever since September 14, 2001, when George W. Bush chose the National Cathedral in Washington as the place to announce a global war on terror in response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11, figures in government and the corporate media have sought to treat 9-11 as part of a civic religion, to sacralize 9-11 so that it would become an act of impiety of blasphemy even, to question any part of the official story of what happened. As Gore Vidal has remarked, in media circles, quote, it is an article of faith that there are no conspiracies in American life, unquote. <laughs> Not surprisingly, conspiracy theory and associated terms of abuse have been tirelessly deployed to intimidate and delegitimize skeptics to deflect attention away from critical and evidence-based analysis, and to persuade a public already immersed in media spectacle and numbed by sophistry to accept a permanent displacement of rational thinking by ad hominem sneers. Are we then to forget the growing mass of contradictions, misdirections, omissions, and direct falsehoods within the official 9-11 narrative that have been brought to light by the patient critical research of many public-spirited citizens, among them scholars, scientists, engineers, architects, pilots, and lawyers. Let us remember, rather, 
how persistent these researchers have been in their exercise of citizenship. And in particular, how persistent family members of the direct victims of 9-11 have been in demanding a full and honest account of the events of 9-11. Even while coping with the raw grief of their bereavement, family members gathered together to exert pressures that compelled an unwilling Bush-Cheney administration after more than a year of stonewalling to launch an official inquiry. They attended the hearings of that 9-11 Commission inquiry, expressed their dismay at its mishandling and suppression of evidence, and made trenchant criticisms of the report it published in 2004. More recently, bereaved spouses and parents of 9-11 victims have raised their voices again to protest the equally misleading reports of the, on the destruction of the three World Trade Center towers that have been published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce. <laughs> 